Austin counties. Thank you for having me here. Jose Calderon, I'm a member of the Board of Agriculture of the state. I also work for uh, Farm Pack Products. I'm an international sales manager for them. Uh, Jeff Turner, a member of the Board of Agriculture and Murphy Family Ventures and in Eastern North Carolina. John Dole, interim dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences with North Carolina State University. There we go. Rich Bonanno, um, Associate Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the Director of the Cooperative Extension in North Carolina. <clears throat> Josh Heitman, I'm a professor of soil science at North Carolina State University. Hello, Maggie Manis, Senior Director for Climate Smart Agriculture at the Environmental Defense Fund. I'm Morris Davenport with J.P. Davenport and Sun down in Greenville, North Carolina, and Pitt County, farmer. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Beard. I'm with the United States Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources, Conservation Service, State Conservation. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Administrator, to everyone. I'm Regional State, USDA Rural Development, State Director. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Etheridge, uh, USDA State Executive Director of FSA. I'm Rhonda Garrison, Executive Director of the Corn Growers Association of North Carolina. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Novak, President and CEO for Crop Life America. I represent a trade association that represents our ag chemical companies. Hello, my name is Rene Garza. I represent Noble Science, the biggest biotech company in the world, and I'm President of the region North America. Happy to be here. <laughs> Hello, my name is Don Butler. <clears throat> I uh, am retired from Smithfield Foods, Director of Corporate uh, Affairs, and I'm currently working on a technology to uh, drive uh, sludge from swine treatment systems for export out of North Carolina. I'm Danny Watkins. I'm a small farmer from Orange County. I farm with my wife and my two sons. I'm Tom Butler. I'm a swine a producer for Prestige Farms in Western Harney County. Good afternoon, I'm Brian Evans. I'm Executive Director for the North Carolina Association of Soil and Water Conservation Ventures. And I'm Jackie Thompson. I'm a farmer here in Wake County, Northern Park County. Believe it or not, we still farm here in Wake County. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a proud farmer and I'm glad, I um, just really appreciate the invitation to be here to both you fine gentlemen. And I just feel it would be an honor. Thank you so much for letting me be here. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Sherman with North Carolina Farm Bureau. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Wood, farmer of Johnston County, member of North Carolina Sweet Day Commission. Thank you. I'm Brian Blinson, North Carolina Cattlemen's Association Executive Director. Might have been bought on a little bid. <laughs> Uh, I'm Andy Curlis. I'm a SAS, a uh, data global leader in data analytics. Uh, we serve the food supply chain and also both of your agencies. It's good to be with you. Jimmy Gentry, president of North Carolina Grange. David Etheridge, uh, tobacco sweep dead former, Horton County, North Carolina. I'm Barry Worsham, president and CEO of Cotton Incorporated, headquartered just down the road in Cary. I'm Pedro Sharp, farmer in Wilson County and currently chairman of the State FSA Committee. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Andrew Austin, proud classmate of Michael Regan, <laughs> and Associate Dean of Academic Studies in the College of Agriculture, North Carolina AT, and Secretary Bill Second Most of a proud Iowa State Cyclone. <laughs> Rod Snyder, I'm senior advisor for agriculture to Administrator Regan. Uh, Sean Harding, President of North Carolina Farm Bureau. Elizabeth Beiser, Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Sagan Hedgecock, uh, Chief of Staff of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And with that, uh, I think we can see, uh, Secretary Administrator Regan, the diversity of uh, participants we have at this roundtable and listening session, not only diversity of agriculture in this state, but diversity of interest. Uh, as it relates to both your agencies. So with that, I'm going to turn the uh, 
podium over to our uh, Commissioner of Agriculture, Commissioner Troxler, for any opening comments that he may have. And Commissioner, thank you for convening this and allowing us all to be here this afternoon. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I do want to welcome everybody to our Ag Science Center. This is a more, uh, it was five years in the design and building. Uh, we've actually been in it uh, since last October, but because of the pandemic, we've recently had a grand opening and tours of the building. Uh, we think it's probably the only one like it uh, anywhere in the nation because of all the uh, different labs and administrative functions that we have here. And, uh, it has proven its worth recently, and uh, uh, with the federal partnerships that we have, this lab is a big part of uh, some of the things that we partner with you on. So I thank you for being here today, uh, Secretary Vilsack and Administrator Regan, uh, welcome home. Uh, the partnerships that we've had recently with uh, High Path Avian Influenza with USDA, I think have paid big, big, big dividends. Uh, we hope that we've got it in a, a pretty good place in North Carolina right now. But this lab goes way further than that with food safety, uh, veterinary medicine, uh, pesticides, uh, the standards, uh, even motor fuels is uh, located in this lab, so it's a very important part of uh, North Carolina's future, both in agriculture and for the, the general public. Uh, we hope this lab will serve for 30 to 40 years and, and do its job. But we also in North Carolina have done a couple other things that we hope will position us uh, for the future, for the egg science, uh, the egg, uh, plant science initiative at NC State University, uh, combined uh, and, and put that with the Food Innovation Lab in Kannapolis. So we are very concentrated on agriculture in this state, and we should be. It's uh, 95.9 billion dollars in economic impact and growing every day. So we're going to concentrate on that. Uh, this represents a major, major investment, and I think I have built the one and only uh, that takes this much time and energy and money to build, but uh, uh, having my name on it is something that is an extraordinary honor, but you know, the honor really goes to the employees that uh, work so hard to make sure that this lab would fit their needs. Uh, and, you know, just being in the bond issuance to get the lab built, a great contractors, great design team, so it was a team effort and one that is well worth the wait. Uh, we talk about climate smart uh, and commodities, and uh, our agricultural industry, I think, has been climate smart for quite some time, and I think EPA's numbers uh, bear that out. I'm proud to say that uh, agriculture is one of the few industries in the country that can say that we are actually carbon negative. Uh, we actually sequester more carbon than we put out, uh, and that's a start. There's always more things that we can do, certainly, if the incentives are there, uh, if the programs are there, but, you know, more importantly, if the agricultural research is there to prove out what we're doing, and uh, I think back a hundred years in this country, and we were just in the infancy of agriculture and the expansion we've done, but for the most part, we were, you know, farmers, they looked after their own. We had a little extra income, but, you know, when you talk about all the people that uh, one person in agriculture feeds today, it's happened because of agricultural research. So we need to continue to fund that research and, and concentrate it on it because to feed the rest of the world, we can't stand on our laurels. So there's no question about that. The increasing population and even the, the shortage of inputs we know we're going to have less land, less water to work with, so uh, we need to do that research certainly and make sure it stays at the very uh, forefront. In North Carolina, uh, we are big in forestry and ag. In fact, 61% of our state land mass is in trees. I know being from Iowa, that may be a, a different, little different animal, but uh, that is one of the reasons we're so good at being climate smart. In fact, uh, about uh, agriculture and forestry uh, account for 26% of the carbon offsets in this state. So we, that's a good start, a good place to start. We're trying to do more, but what I know is farmers have, 
they, they really respect the natural resource. We have to. Uh, we depend on natural resources for our livelihood, and the old adage that I've been taught all my life is, if you look after the land, the land will look after you. Uh, so I think that is, you know, a good thing to say. Uh, we move forward from today with, with a plan, I hope, uh, for not only this state, but for other states, and I see good things out there. Uh, conservation practices are part of every farmer's tool, uh, toolbox in North Carolina and the nation. Certainly we can expand on that, but we've already got to keep our eye on productivity and efficiency. Uh, the pandemic and now the worldwide crises that we see have proved that agriculture is essential, uh, but it's not easy. There's no question. It's a, it's a hard occupation but one that we take seriously, but let's make sure we do keep our eye on the efficiency in agriculture. We need to keep agriculture in context. Agriculture is the essential industry that feeds us every day. We look after the natural resources, and I hope that that's the narrative that we begin to see uh, in the public. Uh, the narrative that we hear in a lot of cases about ag is, is negative, but like I said, we are sequestering carbon now, and we are going to do our best to do that. We, we're going to be farming no matter what the climate is, there's no question. Uh, if it's too hot, if it's too cold, if it's too dry, or it's too wet, we're going to still be farming and trying to figure out how to be successful in that. So, Thank you once again for being here and hosting this roundtable. Communication is always the key to solving any problem, and I hope that communication starts here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. As Commissioner said, uh, Michael Regan is home. All of us, many, most of us work with uh, the EPA Administrator, who means our DEQ Secretary here in North Carolina. We are all honored that uh, uh, President Biden asked him to come to Washington and be EPA Administrator. Administrator Regan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Larry, and <clears throat> thank you, Larry, for the, the friendship. You know, Larry's been a good mentor over the years, and I've learned a few tricks from Larry. Uh, Commissioner Troxler, thank you for welcoming us. This is, a, this is a marvelous Ag Science Center. You know, in 2017, 2018, and 2019, I think I asked Senator Brent Jackson for similar resources. And, uh, <laughs> I'm still waiting for him to turn that phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's an honor to host my, my good friend, Secretary Tom Vilsack, to be here in North Carolina and attend this roundtable. You know, Secretary Vilsack um, was one of the first calls I got when I was nominated. And he's been a good partner and a good friend and a good mentor from day one, so thank you. Thank you for being here. You know, earlier this month, President Biden kicked off a Building a Better America Rural Infrastructure Tour to talk about the impacts of the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, investments as well as the administration's more broader commitments to ensure that the federal resources that we've all received from that law reaches rural communities all across the United States of America. So I've been excited to join cabinet secretaries all over the country um, as we highlight the billions of dollars that all of our agencies respectively have received uh, to ensure that they're being invested in the small towns and rural communities with the much needed projects that I think we've all been talking about for decades, whether that be broadband, roads, bridges, modernizing our water infrastructure, clean drinking water, affordable, reliable electricity that our rural electric co cooperatives generate, and more importantly, all of that connects to good paying jobs, good paying jobs that we will have in our local communities. So I'd like to say that I'm proud to be a part of the newly launched Rural Partners Network uh, this is the president's whole of government effort to transform the way all of our agencies, all federal agencies, partner with rural places to create these economic opportunities that we know are vital to our communities. Uh, North Carolina has been included in that second round, uh, the second rural partner network cohort to be launched by uh, the end of August. Um, and this is a group of rural communities in the state that will be supported by field staff to help local leaders navigate and access all of these federal resources uh, that we all need to build a strong economy. Secretary Vilsack may speak a little bit more to that later. As you all know, I'm from rural eastern North Carolina, uh, very proud, of, and I understand the importance of agriculture uh, in our communities and in our culture. My, my grandfather was a small farmer, 
and my father farmed for some period of time as well. So uh, you all know that as secretary, uh, this community and this industry has been important, was important to me then, it's important to me now, but more importantly, it's important to President Biden. So when I joined EPA over a year ago, I, I made it clear from the beginning that I had a strong desire to work closely with the farming and ranching community to identify practical science-based policies that protect the environment, but also ensure a vibrant and productive agricultural system. Of course, the challenges facing the ag sector we all know are very significant. The COVID-19 pandemic has placed enormous stress on our supply chains, and now Russia's invasion of the Ukraine has only exacerbated these problems, creating a ripple effect across commodity markets and further disrupting the availability of critical agricultural inputs. At the same time, producers find themselves on the front lines of the climate crisis, facing increasing impacts from extreme weather events like severe storms, widespread flooding, prolonged drought, and more frequent wildfires. I want you to know that our agency, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, is committed to supporting American farmers and ranchers to ensure that they can produce an abundant and uninterrupted supply of food, feed, fuel, and fiber. Last month, in conjunction with National Ag Day, I was proud to announce that EPA has rechartered our long-standing Farm, Ranch, and Rural Communities Advisory Committee, which provides independent advice and recommendations to EPA on environmental issues that are important to our agriculture and our rural communities. I also announced a charge topic for that committee to evaluate EPA's policies and programs at the intersection of agriculture and climate change. So for the next two years, I'm asking the committee to consider how EPA's tools and programs can best advance the United States agriculture sector's climate mitigation and adaptation goals. By identifying voluntary, incentive-based opportunities, public-private partnerships, and market-based approaches, EPA can support farmers and ranchers in their efforts to reduce emissions, sequester carbon, and accelerate a more resilient food and agriculture system. Additionally, we have issued a call for new members to serve on the Farm, Ranch, and Rural Communities Committee, and I encourage all of you and your organizations to consider submitting nominations before the May 16th deadline. Listen, I, I, EPA's mission is to protect public health and the environment, which is a responsibility that I take very seriously. But I also believe that this mission goes hand in hand with food production. Clean water, clean air, healthy soils, where they're fundamental to the success of the United States agriculture industry. So I look forward to this conversation over the next hour. Look forward to hearing how the federal government can do more to support our farmers and ranchers. And I look forward to hearing ideas about how we strengthen rural economies and improve environmental incomes. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my good friend, Secretary Tom Vilsack. Uh, good afternoon, folks. And uh, I just want to thank North Carolina for sending Michael Regan to the to the e Environmental Protection Agency. I've had the pleasure of being secretary for now almost uh, a little over nine years. I've had a chance to visit with and be involved with EPA over a number of different administrators. And I can tell you, there has, uh, in my experience, and I would be willing to say in the experience of the Environmental Protection Agency, no administrator who has been more willing to listen and to be open to the concerns and needs of American agriculture than this guy right here. I mean that sincerely. Um, he has an incredibly tough job. Uh, and he does it in a way that uh, is respectful. Uh, he uh, has had to make some tough decisions and will continue to make those tough decisions, but you will always know why he's made that decision and he, you will always know that you've been heard. Uh, as those decisions are being made. Uh, most recently, we had an interesting conversation with some folks about uh, the expansion of, of biofuels during the summer months. Not an easy decision for the EPA to make at all, uh, but one that uh, the administrator was very cooperative in making uh, in order for us to take and to re maintain the benefit in 2,300 uh, stations across the United States of slightly lower gas prices uh, for consumers. Uh, and I think that that decision, uh, among many others, uh, reflects uh, the kind of guy uh, Michael is. So I, I very much appreciate being here and the invitation that's been extended. Uh, Commissioner, thanks very much for, uh, uh, for uh, giving us all the, the threshold 
we need to have a lab named after us. <laughs> I figured out how to do that. I, I didn't get it done the first time around. I got another shot. <laughs> we built a poultry lab down here in Georgia, maybe. You know. uh, but this lab is incredibly important, as we well know. Uh, our handling of high path avian influenza this time around, I believe, is significantly better than the last time we were hit with this, in large part because we have facilities that allow us to identify it more quickly. We have state officials who have been through this process who understand and appreciate the importance of identification, of quarantine, of eradication. Uh, and so, uh, really appreciate the partnership we've had. Uh, with the commissioner's office, and that partnership will obviously continue. Uh, you know, when I became secretary, and I'm only going to spend about two minutes on this, I, there's a million things I'd love to be able to say to all you folks, but I was uh, struck by an ERS uh, research paper that uh, found its way on my desk early, early, early after I got this job again, in which it reported that 89 Point six, it's now 89.2% of American farms today do not generate the majority of income for the farm families who are farming those farms. And what that told me was that we need to figure out ways in which, to the commissioner's point, we not only continue to be productive, continue to have the research and the innovation necessary for our farms to be incredibly productive, but we have to place as much emphasis on profit as we have on production. <laughs> and what that means in the Department of Agriculture under uh, President Biden is first and foremost figuring out additional ways in which farmers can generate income from what they do on the farm. Commissioner mentioned the fact that you all are stewards and you indeed are. But there are ways and need to be ways in which we essentially compensate you for the environmental benefits that you're creating on your farm so that we create yet another way of making money. You can sell crops, you can feed them to livestock and sell the product, but you've got to have more profit centers. And climate smart agriculture and incentives and markets uh, that reward you for the conservation practices you're undertaking is one way. Second way is to create ways in which the waste product that is produced on the farm can essentially become an ingredient in many different manufacturing processes. As we transition from an economy that has been predominantly fossil fuel based to one that's more balanced with a bio-based economy. And the ability to transition that waste product into materials and fabrics and fibers and fuels and energy and, and, and chemicals and a variety of other ways in which we use that waste product so that we create not just another revenue stream for farmers but also good paying manufacturing jobs here in the U.S. and predominantly in the rural parts of the U.S. Another way to do this is also to make sure that farmers are getting a fair price. The President's very, very keen on competition. Uh, and the necessity of us having, uh, ensuring uh, transparency and openness to make sure that indeed uh, farmers do have an opportunity. And one way to do that is by creating a stronger local and regional food system that complements the commodity-based system we have today. We learned during the pandemic that our system wasn't as resilient. It was incredibly efficient, amazingly efficient, because that was the message we were sending, efficiency productivity. Now we have to send a slightly different message of resiliency and the capacity to deal with disruptions that are going to occur from time to time. And a way to do that is by creating a local regional system that allows farmers to negotiate more directly the price they get for whatever it is they're raising. So these are examples of what we're trying to do at USDA with more new and better markets. So at the end of the day, we see higher profitability for farmers, more jobs in rural places. And the infrastructure bill that this president got passed when many previous presidents, including one I worked for before, couldn't get done 
is going to provide the resources to improve the broadband access that's so critical to precision agriculture, going to improve roads and bridges so product can get to market more quickly and efficiently, going to improve that inland water system so and the ports so that it gets to those export markets. We had a record year of exports last year. We anticipate a record year this year. We want to continue that. By having the transportation system be incredibly efficient, it allows us to be really competitive on those export markets. So there's tremendous opportunity here uh, with this bill and with this effort to try to expand income opportunities for farmers. A multitude of other things we can talk about. Happy to hear from all of you today. And hopefully at the end I have a minute or two to touch on a couple of other issues. Larry, back to you. Thank, thank you very much and thank both of you. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom, a lot of brains, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of ideas in this room. I'll throw the floor open to anyone who has a comment or a question. Uh, certainly, I will reserve the right if your comment gets too long to break in because there's a lot of us here and everybody needs an opportunity to say something if they'd like. Who's going to go first? Uh, Antoine Austin, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I, my question is, what role do you see the 19 historical black, 18 to 90 land grant institutions playing in this landscape of agriculture, particularly with uh, African American farmers and the issues they are having? We're trying to get loans taken care of and just have profitable operations. So that would be my question today. Thank you. I can answer that very quickly. Uh, we know that we need to do a better job of providing technical assistance and guidance uh, to historically underserved producers. Uh, and we believe that the minority serving institutions, historic black colleges and universities, are a great conduit through which we can create additional information. You know, I'm deeply concerned, I know the extension's here today. I'm deeply concerned about what we've done to extension. In the past, it was extension went to the individual farmer and provided advice and counsel, but because we have an adequately funded extension, either there or over here, you've had to change your model. And now you're basically working with consultants who in turn work with producers. And the problem with that, of course, is a lot of folks don't get that information. So. We're looking at ways in which we can expand the capacity to get information to folks and then guide them through the process. The administrator mentioned the Rural Partners Network. That's also what this is about, is making sure that people know where they can go to get the information necessary to apply for the multitude of programs uh, that we have at USDA and EPA has. Who's next? I think Peter Sharp uh, had, a, had a question earlier he wanted to answer, uh, ask. Secretary Bill Sackett and Minister Reagan, thank you for joining us in one of our old farm buildings here in North Carolina. <laughs> uh, my family, grand, great grandfather moved to the farm I farm on 130 years ago. And today, if, if my grandson who's at NC State comes back to the farm like he plans to, we will uh, have six generations that have farmed that land. Our topsoil is still in place. We still drink water out of it well and it's still fish in our ponds so <clears throat> i guess we were climbing smart before that was a term and that's the way agriculture is we we do what we need to do to preserve our resources as we move forward in into the complexities of where we fit in with agriculture and the rest of the world we're going to need your leadership both of your department's leadership to help us overcome the stigma that we are the problem when we're not the problem, and to give us a vehicle by which, as you mentioned, Secretary Bill Sack, we can add another profit center. Uh, we're already doing the right thing. We just need a little help in doing that. Thank you, Secretary Bill Sack, for, for administering the safety net and, and for keeping rural communities viable and for these future programs we're talking about and how they will play out on the farms in this country. And, and Administrator Reagan, when, when you say that it, it's refreshing and reassuring when you talk about the, the environmental responsibility and, and profitable farms, that's, that's something that can go together. And they're not two different things. They're one thing. Thank you so much for, for what you're doing and, and Administrator Reagan for understanding. Anybody have a comment? 
Mr. Secretary, well, I'll comment to that uh, quickly. We're really looking forward uh, to May, uh, where the application deadline for the billion dollars that's going to be provided for our Climate Smart Commodity uh, Partnership Initiative will, will the, the application window will close. We'll see what kind of projects are out there. This is going to give us a roadmap in terms of how we create regular programs, ongoing programs, permanent programs to provide that, that market opportunity and that resource. We're also going to be able to measure and verify and quantify the results of the conservation practices you all are, uh, are, are engaged in so that we can market those results. You, you got to be able to mark, you got to be able to measure, you got to be able to verify. This, this effort is going to allow us to do that, to create a, a, a climate smart commodity with a value added component so farmers get the benefit of that value added and they also get the benefit of being able to say, here's the result from my farm. Someone who needs that result can pay you for that result. It creates an ecosystem market another profit center. Maggie, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary Vilsack, uh, well, I wanted to thank you on behalf of Environmental Defense Fund um, and all of our, our partners, including the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, for the, uh, the Climate Smart Commodities Partnership Program. And thank you for this hour-long break from working on proposals. <laughs> um, and you know, to your point about um, farm profitability and extension, we had the opportunity to work with NCAAT Cooperative Extension on some financial analyses of climate smart practices on small and diverse North Carolina farms, um, and saw how farmers are actually making money through these practices and how these different programs can come together. Um, so I wanted to highlight one other, and this question is for both of you, um, area where I think North Carolina has really been leading um, on collaboration and ways that agriculture can be a solutions provider, and that is in watershed scale flood resilience. Um, as Administrator <coughs> Regan and, and others here are very familiar, we've had a lot of challenges with flooding in our state, um, and a lot of us around this table have been working on opportunities to build local solutions, natural infrastructure like wetlands and buffers, um, and for farmers to be compensated for that and work with communities in order to build resilience at the watershed scale. Um, we are very grateful for um, money that's been allocated in the state budget for that work, um, and I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on how uh, USDA and EPA resources can come together to augment those state level efforts. Administrator Reed. Yeah, well, thank you, Maggie, for that question. I can say um, a couple of things. The first is, when we think about flood mitigation, the, the, the high priority for us right now through the bipartisan infrastructure law is EPA has received $50 billion to focus on water infrastructure. And we know that one way to tackle that is stormwater. We want to be sure that our rural communities are getting those stormwater investments uh, to help take off some of that, that, that water that we're seeing because of climate change. I think we're largely relying on uh, this rural partners network to do exactly what you're getting at, which is how does EPA uh, and USDA and Commerce and others look at the leveraged opportunities for the investment in our rural communities to be sure that we're putting the money where it should be. Uh, the, the one thing that the president has asked all of us to really focus on is that the answers don't come from Washington, D.C., that they come from those on the ground. So one of the, the first things that we're doing at EPA is we're, we're having listening tours. We're spending a lot of time in our rural communities trying to better understand how to answer the question you just posed, because it doesn't look the same all over the country. Um, so we're excited about that. We're excited about the partnerships. Um, and, and I think we do have a lot of solutions that are at our fingertips. The problem isn't solutions. We've never had the resources to execute, and now we have both. We just allocated uh, $420 million in 130 projects across the uh, 31 states on this very issue of, uh, of uh, flood prevention and operations, uh, as well as rehabbing uh, dams uh, and structures. Uh, that complemented another 108 projects, $160 million, $116 million on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. I just want everybody to understand what he said and what I just said. He, you said 50 billion? Well, that's with a B, right? That's with a B. Yeah, I'm talking millions. <laughs> <laughs> the old bait and switch, thanks. <laughs> but but we, we also have the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which is a powerful force of being able to leverage resources within USDA and outside of USDA. 
Uh, and the, the part, Rural Partnership Network, there will be individuals on the ground in North Carolina who will be responsible for working with the community to identify projects. And then there will be a rural desk officer in uh, 16 departments and agencies of the federal government to be able to, that would be the person that you would call when, and, and you would say, look, we're having a problem with DOT down here. So we call the rural desk officer and we say, here's the problem, what's the solution? So it, it provides a, a direct connection now. You don't have to navigate which department, which administrator, you know, what program. It's the rural desk officer's responsibility to report back to the person on the ground here in North Carolina. So we think it's a game changer. Uh, we're piloting it here and, and a number of other states. We think it's a game changer, but I, but there are resources within the USDA programs. We're going to continue to look for ways to leverage Don, thank you. Uh, uh, gentlemen, a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, uh, Secretary Regan, uh, thanks for bringing back the EPA uh, farm ranch rural communities. I sat on that committee for several years during the Bush and Obama administrations, and it'd be great to have that back. A lot of good dialogue took place. I represented the United States when I sat on, on that committee. Uh, in terms of uh, your comments, Mr. Secretary, about capacity funds are really about the extension along with the research, and the Secretary talked about this. Uh, there's a lot that has to be done. There's a lot that's going on, and you know those federal funds that come through NIFA, they leverage all the state funds and then eventually county funds, especially on the extension side, uh, and they just haven't gone anywhere in the last several years. The, the competitive dollars go up, but the capacity dollars uh, don't. And the things that we're dealing with, especially on the research side that the Commissioner alluded to, uh, things, you know, if it was, was long-term slow temperature increases over time, I think we can handle those a whole lot better than we can handle either year variability, things like sea level rise, saltwater intrusion, especially on some of the coastal, uh, you know, farms that we have out in the tidewater area. And those are the things that are incredibly difficult to deal with. And a lot of research, especially in terms of trying to get plants to be more resilient to, to salt water, uh, to dry summers, wet summers, and we don't know what we plant what kind of summer we're going to have. And, and unfortunately, our plants don't know either. So the breeding is incredibly important. Uh, so I appreciate all of, those, all of those comments. I think farmers really want to do a good job. When I was at a corn growers board meeting recently, we started listening to the corn growers talking about what can we do? What can we do differently to help? Because they're seeing these changes in their fields, and they want, they want to try to still be productive and profitable and be able to feed the families and pay the bills. Uh, Commissioner? Oh. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the uh, water infrastructure money that was announced, uh, I think, Friday in Georgia. But North Carolina got $39.3 million of that money, and I know two of the projects are going to be done in Robinson County, and uh, uh, Administrator Regan, you have flown with me and seen that firsthand, and that, that money is, you know, is a godsend, but it's going to take a lot more to do it. Uh, and since you are North Carolina's secretary level representative, can I give you credit for sending the bacon to North Carolina? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I know you folks are all smart. I said $420 million, 31 states. Do the math. Divide 31 into 420. What would that be per state? Like 15 million? And you guys got what? 39.3, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> that was the point, thank you. Well, I think the, the Secretary made an excellent point earlier, which is when we look at this rural network that we're all a part of, you, you take that $39 million that the Commission and the Secretary are talking about, from the bipartisan infrastructure law just for the first year, North Carolina will get $200 million to focus on water infrastructure. I think we have to be sure that our rural communities get their fair share of that $200 million. But when you start looking at $39 million, $200 million, the resources that the state legislature is making available, you're going to have probably you know tens of millions of dollars in broadband investments from commerce. You're going to see a lot of money from HHS as well. It's important that we think about all of this money collectively. And as the Secretary mentioned, we don't want you all to have to knock on a thousand doors. You need one point of contact to talk about how you can package all of your needs to best leverage these, what I would consider to be hundreds of millions of dollars thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law. So that's important for us. Robin Garrison, corn growers, floor is yours. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. Um, I suppose my question and comment is probably a little, more, a little bit more granular than what we've uh, been talking about up until now. Um, <clears throat> 
the uh, atrazine situation ha and, uh, and basically uh, watering it down to the point that it is water, or a little bit, a little bit more effective than water. And as the as the commissioner pointed out earlier, you know we are pretty much a carbon negative state, and taking atrazine away from our farmers is going to turn us into a carbon neutral at best state because we're going to have to go back to plowing, using more chemicals at one time, and. Um, that probably aren't as safe. And of course, the, the data on atrazine at its current level shows that it is safe. And um, uh, just the request has been made to please just leave it alone and, and quit messing with something that works. I, I appreciate the, the, those comments. And I, I'll just take a step back and say whether it's atrazine, atrazine clopyrifos, dicamba, you know, the reality is, is that um, EPA has struggled for decades to keep up with the Endangered Species Act. It's not the Biden administration coming in saying, let's make these changes. The courts have mandated that EPA, through litigation, make these changes. And so I think what we've attempted to do uh, is be very transparent with the ag community that, you know, there are certain chemicals, uh, certain pesticides, uh, certain herbicides that the courts have either basically tied our hands to the point where we have to make certain decisions or given us a little bit of flexibility to make different decisions that would comply with the direction that litigation has taken. So I think that we've attempted uh, to be very transparent uh, and, and work with the ag community on how we transition. The reality is, is that um, when you look at what the courts have mandated that we do and the opportunities for new chemicals to come online to the market, EPA is woefully under budgeted to, to help expedite some of these new market entrants. So what we've got to do is we've got to walk and chew gum at the same time. Our first goal is to get out from under the courts. We don't like the courts telling us to do things any more than you do. Uh, when, when we look at some of the, like chlorpyrifos, the courts basically, the Ninth Circuit said, Unless you can tell us there's absolutely no adverse impacts from this pesticide, you have to take it off the market. We didn't have the resources, the science, or anything to make that legal determination. How he knows about so, so my point is, is that we feel your frustration. We're frustrated as well. We want to get out from under the court's thumb. We, we need more resources. We're asking Congress for more resources so that we can do the science, do the math, and get some new market entrance um, as soon as possible for some of these replacement chemicals. Thank you. Renee Garza, you're next, and then I'll call on Brian Evans. Thank you. Administrator and, and Secretary, I have a first uh, a thanks, an uh, invitation, and, uh, and an ask. So uh, the thanks is thank you, thank you, thank you for E15 during the summer. Uh, we know that you, you both have been champions and, and, and leaders, and believe me, I drove with my family to Asheville to the mountains over the weekend and uh, fuel with E15, uh, American-made, sustainable, fuel that reduces CO2 emissions. Thank you very much. This matters and matters a lot. Thank you for your leadership on this. The invitation is uh, for you to visit uh, our Franklinton, North Carolina site, which is the biggest enzyme manufacturer facility in the U.S., where we make and develop biotech sustainable technology that impacts the whole value chain in agriculture, from helping farmers to improve yields through natural microbes and use less water, less uh, pesticides, to helping ethanol plants make more ethanol and diversify their businesses, helping them to make more corn oil that they can monetize, more high protein feed, animal feed as well through biotechnology, and also um, to see the future of sustainable chemistry. So you're both invited. It's 45 minutes from here, not that far. Um, and then the ask, uh, and, and, and Mr. Regan, this is probably for, for you is, um, on the RFS RBOs, um, the sooner uh, I, we know that you're working very hard on, on this, uh, uh, Secretary Bilzik as, uh, as well, we, we have these discussions, uh, but it, the sooner uh, we can release those so that we create a little bit more of certainty, uh, market certainty, that can support these additional investments in sustainable technology. Well, well thank you for that. I'll tell you that the E15 uh, decision, while it while it was my decision, the EPA's decision to, 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 to look at the waiver, I could not have made that decision without Secretary Bilson. I think that my job is to look at the science and look at what the law allows. And I think the Secretary was able to 
help support not only the science, but look at the economic impact that we receive for those 2,300 or so uh, gas stations. Uh, so listen, the president pledged uh, on day one that when uh, Russia waged this unprovoked war, that it wouldn't be easy, but that he would use every tool in his toolbox to help relieve some of that pressure that we're seeing at the pump. That E15 decision is a good example of two agencies coming together and trying to help the president meet that, that promise. And we're going to keep looking for solutions like that. And, and the president said from day one that biofuels and agriculture would have a seat at the table. I take that very serious, and I take my relationship with Tom very serious. And so we're looking at every avenue possible. On the RBOs, 2020, 2021, 2022, it's not, it's not a, a well-kept secret that uh, you know, the RFS program has just been a nightmare for a number of years. Goal number one for EPA is to provide some certainty to the market. And that's why we decided to package 2020, 2021, and 2022. With threading the needle, uh, we want to do that well to set that floor and that foundation. I think the latter year, you'll see that we're starting to move in a very aggressive direction to get more bio, biofuels in the market. I think you'll see that trend continue when we start to look at the step rule, when we start looking at 23, 24, and 25. So what we try to do is clean up a little bit in 2020. We looked at some actuals in 2021. I think you see a more aggressive approach in 2022. We want to keep that trajectory going moving forward. Thank you. Brian. Administrator uh, Regan, I just want to say a very special thank you for the comments you made about voluntary incentive-based conservation. And to play on Secretary Gilsack, what you said about profitability in agriculture doesn't does lead to investment in conservation. I worked in a local conservation district for many years, and that was uh, very easily seen. Farmers' profitability was up, their investment in conservation was up as well. So appreciate you both taking that approach to conservation in the future. We feel like that will help push us forward. Thank you. Jerry Gentry. I very much appreciate both of you being here. I'm, I'm thinking more and more that a field with a good healthy crop next to a forest of good healthy trees is much better for sequestering carbon than pavement buildings and so forth. In other words, our loss of farmland to development, I believe, is a, is a problem. And, and I've heard our own commissioner talk about this uh, a, tre a tremendous amount. I see it as an environmental problem because once you destroy the field and put in any kind of building, that building is not going to sequester carbon like the crop is. So is there, a, is, is there a concern at the federal level about this and uh, what, what might be happening in the future related to saving our farmland? 2,000 acres a day, 2,000 acres a day, we lose. So you bet we're concerned about it. There are short-term responses, which is to continue to look for ways in which resources can pro be provided for easements to preserve and protect the land for agricultural purposes. And we continue to promote uh, that effort. It's a smaller effort in the scheme of the, the, the challenge that we face. Um, I think the ability to create these profit centers connected to climate create the opportunity for people to resist selling the land for development purposes because they in fact now do see a clearer path to profitability so the next generation can in fact farm without having to work two or three jobs off the farm to be able to do so. So I think that's really critically important. So easements, uh, one way, one strategy. Uh, Increasing profitability, I think, is the ultimate answer to your question. And raising people's awareness. Um, you know, you mentioned force. We had this conversation uh, uh, before we, we came in. Uh, because of the, uh, because of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, we now have uh, resources that we didn't have before at USDA through the Forest Service to encourage replanting uh, and planting of trees. We have a goal of planting 1.2 billion trees uh, across the United States. And, and so that then becomes as well. And new ways to use uh, wood, 
uh, you're going to see a lot more uh, framing, uh, not just for, for homes, but large scale tall building construction using uh, wood as the structural uh, members uh, of buildings. A tremendous opportunity with cross laminated timber that, that opens up a new avenue. You're going to see aviation biofuel, uh, multiple ways to produce it. One way, uh, obviously, through crops, but also uh, woody biomass. So now all of a sudden you're creating a variety of ways in which that forest can generate activities, income, processing, mills, uh, manufacturing. And I think if you do that, you bring prosperity back to those rural communities, you make it less likely that they're willing to say concrete over. Jackie Thompson. Thank you, Larry. I'm Jackie Thompson, and I'm a farmer in Northern Lake County, the county we're in here right now. I moved here, my family moved here in 1957 from over in Franklin Vance County, which is where Henderson Lewisburg is a little north of here. My father came here to better uh, provide for his family in a farming environment, and we are so happy that we did. But what's happening now is uh, my dad made a statement years ago to the individual on the farm that we moved on, the gentleman asked him if he, if he knew a good farmer that could farm the land over in Wake County. My dad said, yes, it's me. And this gentleman said, well, Mr. Thompson, you don't want to leave uh, Vance County, do you? He said, I don't believe Vance County, but it's already left me because it needed more of an environment and more of a way to provide for his family. Now we're in a family, we're here in Wake County. And Wake County is just about leaving me in what I've loved to do for me for over 65 years, being in Wake County. Because with the environment we're living in is being uh, inundated by people that are coming in. And I've listened to your comments around the state, and everybody's been spot on in what they've shared. We need to incentivize, incentive, give farmers a landowner's incentive, uh, Secretary Vilsack and, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Reagan. We need to give them an the incentive to keep their farmland to keep and pass it down generation after generation. But there are a couple of things, and I'll make my, my, uh, present my comments to you short. Uh, I started in 1991, Secretary Bill Sack, with the H-2A program. And, and you, you nod and I'm referring to because you know where I'm going with it. It has been a hardship for 30 years doing it. We've had lots of administrations come and go, and nobody seems to know what to do with it. So my question is, who needs to be the governing body? Is it your, is it your office, Secretary Bill Sack, USDA? Who needs to be the, the governing body of it to help straighten this out? Because we've talked about a lot of different things in this room today, but when it comes to planting these crops, and North Carolina is not like where you are in your, your state, uh, Secretary Bill Sack, we got apples, we got peaches, tobacco, uh, potatoes, everything that we need to have harvested. So we need some help with that. So I'd appreciate anything you guys could do in consideration of that. Help us out with the H2A program. Thank you so much for both of you being here. Uh, Mr. Thompson, I'm going to respond to your question in a very frank way. And I'm probably going to irritate somebody around this table, but so be it. Uh, the first thing we need to do before we quote unquote fix H2A is fix the damn immigration system in this country. It's broken. And I will tell you, everybody in Washington, D.C., who's in a position of authority, and I mean everybody, knows it's broken. And what's more, everybody knows how to fix it. I mean, this is not some very difficult issue to figure out. You got to secure the border. You got to create a pathway for people who've been here for a long, long time, who've worked their tails off on farms all across this country allow them to come out of the shadows and, and create a process where they pay a fine, acknowledge they didn't get here the proper way, just like we, that's how we deal with folks who don't do things the proper way, we, we find them. But here's the problem. There are some in Washington, D.C. that would prefer to use this as a way of dividing you from me. And I will tell you, I am really sick and tired of it. Because you all hire us to solve problems, not to ignore them, and not to postpone them, and not to blame the other guy because he didn't get it done. Pox on everybody here. It needs to get solved. 
And we, we, the collective we, the citizens, the folks around this table, need to empower the politicians in D.C. to say, look, we're not going to hold it against you if you actually do solve this problem. We're not going to pay attention to that 30-second commercial that's claiming that you're letting people run wild in the country. So first and foremost, people have to have the guts, the political guts, and we got to give them the guts to do it. Secondly, we need a consistent system on H-2A. We, we went from a relatively small number many years ago to several hundred thousand. And we need a different approach. And I can tell you, I, don't, I can't tell you the details of this, but I'm working on something uh, that would provide a little more consistency in this program. You ask who's in charge of it? Well, it's not the Department of Agriculture. It's the Department of Labor and Department of Homeland Security. What we can do is educate those two departments about the necessity and the importance of that labor supply for American agriculture. Yes, sir. Um, and I do that. I, 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 you know, I've talked to the Homeland Security Secretary about this. I've talked to the Labor Secretary about it. We've got to have a system that's consistent, that, 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 that is workable, and isn't so complex that the average guy can't figure it out. So to me, it's fix the immigration system, and that would take the pressure off H-2A, frankly and then simplify the H-2A system. Uh, but it's going to take some people with political guts to get it done, and I think somehow we've got to figure out how to do that, empower those folks to do it. Thank you. Chris Novak, floor is yours, and Barry Worship. Uh, Mr. Administrator, you, you started to touch on this earlier. It's a different aspect of infrastructure than what we in agriculture usually think of. But uh, right now, uh, within EPA, it takes about four years for us to register a new pesticide product. Uh, we'll spend about 10 years developing that product before we present anything. And part of that reason for delay, as we understand it, is you've gone from 900 employees to 600 or 500, and you don't have the people in place to meet the obligations that Congress has put upon you. Secretary Vilsack, you talked last week as well about uh, your rural development agency and the challenges of, of getting dollars out the door. So we may not necessarily love more government, but we need government to work and to be effective. And I think part of the problem seems to be that you don't have the people in place. So how can we in agriculture help you uh, address that problem? Well, that's an excellent question, Chris. And I think what, what we saw and what we asked for in the President's 2022 budget, uh, we didn't get it. And, it, and it's because Congress didn't have the, the willpower to give it to us. We're going back and we're going to ask again in 2023. I think some people think it's a good idea to cut the regulator because that means no more regulations. That's a bad idea in a situation like this. I think what is very clear, I mean, it's, it's just very clear math. We don't have the bodies to process the request to get the products to the market. It's very simple. And so we've made a clean ask for the bodies and the expertise at EPA so that we can you know, let this floodgate loose. And we know that we can do it. We know that we can do it in a scientifically protective way. And we know that there's a lot of market potential out there that's pent up. So the, the best thing we all can do is work together and go to Congress and make the request. And it doesn't have to be a blanket request. I think people understand line items. The very clear ask in there for these resources, for these people, so that we can get this market going. Uh, I would just make, uh an additional point in, in addition to the one that Michael just made, which is that if we're really concerned about fiscal responsibility and, and, and good government, you got to have people to be able to provide good governments. So just, just so you understand, the Department of Agriculture's loan portfolio is $258 billion. We have $258 billion of loans outstanding to farmers, to uh, uh, multifamily housing to single-family uh, homes, 258 billion. I, I looked it up. We'd be like the seventh or eighth largest bank in the country with that loan portfolio. We we don't have enough people to keep good tabs of that loan portfolio. Is that fiscally responsible to all of you? No, it's not. You know, the FSA offices last year they did 58,093 farm loans. NRCS, you guys did 43,894 in uh, conservation contents. That's uh, over 100,000 activities and actions with a staff, pandemic-stricken staff, and lower staff numbers. Remarkable job. 
But you know what's happening? People are leaving because they're tired of doing two jobs or three jobs. And, and I tell you, I'm really concerned about this. So those data points help you make the case. And then 8% of our workforce is under the age of 35. So you all want farm loans? You want conservation? You want incentives? You're going to have to have people in the USDA. And it's tough when you're basically having people work two or three jobs. Barry Worsham. Thank you, and uh, appreciate uh, both being here. Just want to convey one a challenge that I think our industry, I represent the cotton industry, I don't know if anybody else is tied directly to that, but it's just one of the challenges we face is that brands and retailers really around the world are demanding, as you know, in many industries, more and more information about environmental the metrics of, of whatever the product you're making. And that's a challenge of enough, enough but what's happened in, in recent years, as you're well aware, with the Uyghur situation in Western China, uh, the traceability and transparency has become, you know, another important issue at about the same time. And one of the things that may be different from cotton is we have a very long supply chain. From the growing of cotton all the way, you, know, you grow it, you gin it, you have yarn fabrics, a yarn making fabric, making dyeing and finishing product, and then ultimately to the retailers. So the people who are really demanding this around the world, the brands and retailers, are a long way away from the producer. So the challenge, I think, in the, in the industry is keeping, not only getting growers to participate in, in sustainability programs like the ones that the cotton industry are developing, but keeping them. And I, I, I just kind of leave you with the thought that the alternative, if you leave cotton, let's we'll say from a, from a textile standpoint, we're not gonna lose cotton business to other growing, uh, cotton growing countries. We'll lose it to polyester. That's it's an alternative to cotton. So we are one product that has a non-cotton or non-agricultural alternative. And the reality is about 70% of all polyester is produced in China. So it's not really a very sustainable alternative. So um, we appreciate, I think one of the, the challenges we face, that we as a as a checkoff program face, and, and I'm glad to hear how you guys are representing, I think changing the mindset of, of growers sometimes from sustainability and, and traceability and transparency being a club to be beaten over the head with versus continuing to convey opportunities and give them examples that we there are opportunities in this field that the U.S. has done a lot of really good things that we as a you know as a uh, as cotton growers or corn growers wherever it may be we have an opportunity to capitalize on this so this is really a kind of a change in mindset from the past that sustainability was a word that paid growers feared and now it's it's a potential for opportunities what do you think in that sort of area of uh, you know, it's, uh, it would be very, it's continues to be very helpful. And the challenge we face is the brands retailers say they'll pay, but they won't pay until you get it. And you can't set it up until you have money. So it's a chicken and egg kind of thing. So uh, again, thank you for mentioning fiber in your remarks, this, uh, in addition to fuel. <laughs> B, a lot of times that's omitted. Uh, but again, thank you both for being here and listening to our concerns. Thank you. It, it, it is precisely the, reason why we established the Climate Smart Commodity Initiative to, to respond exactly to your concern by being able to create a set of metrics, uh, a way of verifying and quantifying the result, and then being able to reassure the consumer, whoever that might be in the supply chain, that that result is, is real. Uh, and, and, and I'm excited about the fact that so many ag groups, conservation groups, environmental groups came together in the alliance that, was, that Maggie referred to earlier, uh, to basically say, look, we want you to do this, but here's how we want you to do it. And I think it's fair to say the department listened to all of you and structured it pretty much in, along the lines of what you all recommended, because we've got a lot of walk for a run. But I, I, I think this is the future, and I'm excited about it. We're responding to your opportunities for that way. Well, I think so are a lot of other folks. <laughs> but Maggie's not, because she's here. <laughs> Senator Jackson. You have the floor, and then I'll ask Lawrence Davenport for a comment. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate you both being here. And Michael, since you're getting so many billions, <clears throat> the state put in over 140 million uh, in stream and debris cleanup and trying to figure out this process. We could use a couple more billion <laughs> to do that here because that's what we need. We need bees, not eagles. So, 
be kind to me as I was to you at one time. <laughs> he exaggerates, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> you ask his predecessor. <laughs> I've been very generous to her <laughs> as appropriations chair. But, <laughs> but uh, Mr. Secretary, I really truly appreciate your comments on immigration. I have worked on immigration and lobby those halls in D.C. since the early 90s because 1986 was the last time we had any true immigration reform in this country that has amounted to anything. These H-2A wages that they were referring to, though, is driving us out of business. I mean, it's getting where we have to be very select. We're in the produce business, but we're also very diversified, you know, in our operation. And, I mean, we're over 6,000 acres, and it's very diversified. But, you know, these wages are just, they've got to be tied to something instead of just a 4 to 6 or 7% increase year over year. As well as we've got to completely redo immigration and get us workers. Because the bottom line is, American workers are not going to do this work. They really aren't. And the thing that concerns me the most about us not doing anything about immigration, I had the opportunity of sitting down with the Mexican uh, the consulate from Mexico back six years ago. And he told me by the year 2025, because they had just come back from Mexico City of having a, all the consulates around the world gather. And he said by the year 2025, they were told Mexico will have to import workers to get their work done too. That is concerning. So, you know, I'm willing to help in any way I possibly can on that. And one other comment I'd like to make, there's a lot of folks and farmers in this state and the nation that has been doing the right things when it comes to environmental things such as cover crops and those things. And let's, if we come out with these new programs, let's don't penalize them by not letting them participate. So but thank you both for being here. Uh, let me respond to the last question first, which is that the way this is structured, early adopters are not going to be penalized. Uh, we want them to be recognized for what they've done. I was the first secretary in 20 years that appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee to testify on behalf of the Ag Worker Modernization Act. Now, what's really frustrating about this is the producers and the worker, uh, the unions, got together and basically handed, handed Congress the answer. So you don't have to worry about us pitting against each other. Here's what we collectively agree to. House passes it bipartisan, strong bipartisan vote. Goes to the Senate. I'm testifying. I was told, I was called naive. Uh, I was called uh, uh, somebody who didn't know what he was talking about uh, because I was there to talk about the importance of getting stability in the workforce and the way in which wages would be calculated so they would never go way, way up or way, way down. They would, there would be some degree of sensibility to it. It ought to pass, but it can't pass today because they can't get 60 votes because there are folks who want to use it for political purposes. It's outrageous. Lawrence Davenport, time's getting away from us, okay. folks. So I'll, I'll be, thank you, Larry. Lots already been said, and I'd love to thank you all for being here, and I'd love to talk about H2A and cotton versus polyester and all this. Uh, subjects uh, as a 50-some year farmer, uh, but I really came here to talk about the flood mitigation and, and the flooding money. When I realized, Mr. Administrator, several months ago that the, the uh, resources coming down the pipe really were where it would be, uh, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be a shame if we see all that money down and it was spent like it has been in the past in a way, a lot of it not being where it should be. The top, my top priority in studying that, Mr. Administrator, you've already covered in that it should be one point of contact. That one point of contact for all the folks to work up to is, in my opinion, the number one thing you got to do. The second thing, though, is, and I want to go back to a little analogy, Mr. Secretary, um, when, 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 Farmers were asked 50, 60 years ago to increase efficiency and increase production. Uh, as you said, they turned to that and they did it way more than anybody ever expected. So with this money coming down the pipe, when we start talking about flooding and flood mitigation, 
Let the farmers do the same thing again. We think we know how to fix it. There's, he's fifth generation, I'm fifth generation. My grandfather was one of the largest conservationists in this state. I understand uh, flooding and, and uh, water management and that kind of stuff, as most farmers do. If we don't, we don't succeed. Water is a big product, project. And flooding is more than, than we've ever seen it before, but there are reasons for that. So I'm going to quit by saying, please let agriculture be at the table when you try to solve and spend all this money. The farmers will figure out how to do it if you let them. Any, any comment, Mr. Um, Secretary? I just say amen. <laughs> <laughs> Those two guys you're sitting next to? Yeah. I know. Ask, ask them who they talk to every day. Now, we're not going to get out of here. You think I'm going to get out of here without letting my Farm Bureau president have a question? <laughs> no, I'm wrong. I'm not going to, not going to do that. Sean Hardy, you have the floor. But thank you, Larry. And, and uh, I don't know if it's a question as much as a congratulations. Um, gentlemen, one of the things that we're most proud of in North Carolina is how we work together in, in agriculture. We work together, and I'll give Larry a lot of credit for that, working with Steve, our Department of Agriculture, our universities. We get things done. And that's the model we need to have going forward. And so I just want to say congratulations. You mentioned hold a government approach President Biden is talking about. And having both of these agencies working together is what we've got to have to solve these climate issues and the things we're talking about. You know, we've done that at Farm Bureau. We've reached out to the Environmental Defense Fund. We're working together. Let's solve these problems together. But talk about that a little bit, if you can, what it's like to have two federal level government agencies working together, if you can talk about it. But thank you. Uh, I can speak to it from EPA's equities, and I can say it's culture shock. Um, yeah. You know, it's, um, there, there are a lot of uh, wars that have been waged between agencies over the past 20, 30 years. And I think uh, leadership starts at the top. The president has given us an assignment. Um, I can say that every cabinet secretary around the table has rolled up their sleeves and has focused on how do we break down the silos and how do we leverage these opportunities. I think it's, it, it was before the bipartisan infrastructure law, we really were focused on how do we leverage the science, how do we leverage our legal understanding, how do we leverage our market potential, and how do we create that win-win. Um, I, I think that, as you all know, when I was in the state of North Carolina, and as I'm doing in Washington, D.C., it's about building consensus. Um, and, and that's critical. And in Washington, D.C., uh, consensus is a dirty word. But I, I think with uh, folks like Secretary Vilsack and I uh, not being afraid to be seen in public together, <laughs> uh, it's a big step. Uh, step number two is demonstrating that we know how to cut deals and we know how to get things done. And then step three is people actually are excited about that and then you start to move on. I, I think that we've done a pretty good job and that's because we like each other. But a big part of it is the president said that we have to do it. Um, and he's walking the walk and we're walking the walk as well. So these resources that we have um, really create an opportunity, a once in a generation opportunity. And if we don't take advantage of it, shame on us. Abe Lincoln established the Department of Agriculture in 1862. Now just think about 1862. What, were, what was going on in the country then? We had a little conflict going on. Uh, yeah, we had the Intercontinental Railroad. We had the Morrell Act. We had the Department of Agriculture established. Okay. And he often said emphatically that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And folks, that advice in 1862 is as applicable today as it was back then. We, we have big problems. We have major challenges as a country and as a humankind. I mean, big problems. They cannot be solved in a partisan way at the end of the day. And they can't be solved if I'm in my silo and he's in his silo and those silos never, never talk. So people say to me, you know, what is the relationship between USDA and EPA? And I say, well, first of all, he's got a tough job. 
and he, he referred to it earlier, everything he does was either directed by Congress in a law or by a judge in a court proceeding. It's not like he's sitting in his office thinking, well, now what can I do today? <laughs> <laughs> he's being told he has to do it. All right? And what, what we can do is we can make sure he understands the impact on all of you. And then we can work to see whether or not where that middle ground may exist, where the edge might be able to be taken off just a bit. We may suggest that he go out and talk to farmers, which Michael's done. And then we might say, look, man, this is a tough issue. Farmers are going to have a hard time. So we at USDA have to figure out what can we do to mitigate the consequences of whatever he makes a decision. You know, Rhonda, when you ask about all these chemicals, what can we do? Well, maybe we can figure out, Chris, how to, how to uh, accelerate and put more resources in research to try to get those answers. So, so that, that's the relationship. And I've got the same relationship with the trade representative. You would be shocking to me that ag secretaries and trade representatives don't get along. What? It's trade's really important to ag, right? So I have an ongoing conversation with a trade representative, and the result of it is we're seeing wins here and there. You know? A little more pork being sold to India, a little more corn being sold to Vietnam, a little more beef being sold to Japan, right? It's all working together. Now, the last thing I would say is the president is very clear about this because he understands somewhere, somehow, we got to start remembering how to get along. We've, we've perfected the ability of dividing each other. We, we're really good at that today. But we have forgotten how to listen and how to compromise and how to take half a loaf. We've got a great relationship. And that's just no BS. That's the honest to God truth. I have a lot of respect for this guy. Why? Because he's come out and he's, he's talked to farmers. I've been with him several times. The last comment before we uh, ask the commissioner and our guests to make a final comment, we'll call on the acting dean of NC State uh, College of Ag, John Doe. Thank you very much. Boy, what a great conversation. I want to thank you all. I would love to have our entire college listen to this. I want to, you know, we're talking about the sustainability of farms, and one of the key factors in that uh, are young people staying in rural areas and going back to rural areas. As the average age of farmers increases, um, it's becoming more important that we encourage folks to come back, and I would encourage you to be thinking about that as well uh, in your programming. Certainly, the universities, and I'm looking down at NCAT as well, we're trying to do what we can uh, to help train young people from rural areas and then encourage them to go back. And certainly, extension is uh, helping to develop the human infrastructure as well. So I would encourage you to be thinking about the, uh, the viability of rural areas and farms as careers for our young people. Secretary, comment on that? Well, Boy, I'm really going to risk myself here. When I talk to farmers back home, this is probably just Iowa, probably not North Carolina, here's what I hear. I, I hear, Mr. Secretary, uh, we are overtaxed, we are overregulated, and we are overworked. And I say, is that what you're telling the next generation of farmers? May be all true, but is that, is that how you're marketing the opportunity to farm? as opposed to what we've talked about here today. Farmers and agriculture is the, in my view, this is me, I think it's the most logical place to start on climate of any industry in the country. I think agriculture will get to a more sustainable future faster than construction, than utilities, or even transportation. So if you're a young person and you want to change the world, agriculture. If, if you're a young person and you want to be an entrepreneur establishing a local regional food system, no better place to do it. If you're interested in renewable energy, no, no better place to, to do it than on the farm. 
that they're, if you're interested in, in helping feed people, whether it's in Ukraine or in North Africa or the Middle East that are now going to be really challenged because of the, the, the Russian invasion, agriculture, American agriculture, is the place to make a difference, to save lives. I mean, we, we got to market this differently. This is an exciting place to be. We got to make it more profitable. But we also, and I think it's beginning to happen. I think people see this as, hey, you know, agriculture is actually pretty cool. You know, we're seeing that more people going to ag departments and, and schools. So I, I think we got to market it more effectively. And, and it's part of my job. And we're, we're very, very focused on this. I'm, I'm doing two commencement speeches next week. And I can guarantee you at Utah State, at the University of Minnesota, Crooks in Minnesota, I'm going to talk about, here's what, you, if you really want to make a difference in the world, here's what you, here's some things you could do in agriculture at this point. Rural America, what a great place. It's a place where it feeds us. The water we drink comes from rural America. The electricity in this beautiful building, where do you think it comes from? It doesn't come from the power plant. It comes from someplace in rural America, right? It's a windmill or it's a solar panel or it's whatever. It's where people recreate when they want to get away from it all. And it's a place that disproportionately you all send your sons and daughters to the military in significantly proportionate numbers, disproportionate numbers. It's a really important place, which is why we're traveling around for the next couple of weeks making sure people and rural folks know, know that we care about it. And we appreciate it. So, Larry, that's my closing comment. Too. <laughs> well, well, I think it's a great closing comment. And uh, I think uh, all of you know that we can stay here until 8 o'clock, continue this discussion. Uh, Michael Regan, if I get uh, Commissioner of Agriculture in North Carolina to get us a barbecue truck out there, we can stay here, <laughs> we stay here a while longer. But uh, this has been a great discussion. Obviously, it's uh, a lot of important issues, important to uh, North Carolina, important to the country. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, Commissioner Troxler, you have a final comment? It's always good to have the last say. Uh, but I do appreciate the frank discussion here today about uh, agriculture and rural North Carolina, rural America. Uh, we can't give up on it. This is the roots of this country. It's the backbone of this country. We've all got to work together to make it better. There's no question. Uh, without a, another generation coming back to the farm, there's going to be a lot of hungry people. And I have a say that hungry people are mean people. So we can never forget that. But in appreciation of uh, the two of you being here today, I just wanted to give you a little memento to remember us in North Carolina. Uh, Mr. Uh, good, uh, Administrator, I keep wanting to say your name, but that's not the way it ought to be. <laughs> but uh, it's fine. It's fine. these are actually the food distribution trucks that we deliver USDA food to school cafeterias and food banks in North Carolina. So. Uh, I would hope that you would display that proudly, and uh, we will keep, if you'll keep sending the food, we'll keep putting it out, but if you almost overdid it the last two years, by the way, uh, I think $130 million is what we ran through food distribution, and uh, two years ago, I thought $60 million worth of food was a lot, but we did it with the same trucks, the same amount of help, the same facilities, uh, so... Uh, we got it done. You keep sending. We'll keep getting it out there. 9.9 .9 billion pounds is what we purchased last year. 9.9 .9 billion pounds. Michael Regan, your final comment? Yeah, I just want to say thank you all for taking the time and spending the time. I, I really enjoy having these frank conversations. And to be honest, I think the Secretary said it best. We are uh, looking for ways to partner. We're trying to solve some problems. We're trying to build consensus. We're trying to duck and dodge the political rancor and really just get things done for that everyday average person. So with that in mind, you know, if there are problems or if there are issues or if you're hearing anything, just give us a call directly. Reach out to our staff. We can solve problems a lot quicker having direct conversations and just getting down to the, the nitty gritty. So thank you all for being here and I appreciate your time. Participation. Uh
and for your service to the state of North Carolina and to the country. With that, uh, this meeting is adjourned. So,